Book Five, Chapter One of the Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume Three by Pliny the Elder. Book Five: Domestic Animals, Chapter One the dog examples of its attachment to its master among the animals that are domesticated with mankind have occurred many circumstances that deserve to be known among these animals are more particularly those faithful friends of man the dog and the horse we have an account of a dog that fought against a band of robbers in defending its master and although it was pierced with wounds still it would not leave the body from which it drove away all birds and beasts another dog in epirus recognized the murderer of its master in the midst of an assemblage of people and by biting and barking at him extorted from him a confession of his crime a king of the Garamantes was brought back from exile by two hundred dogs, who maintained the combat against all his opponents. The people of Colophon and Castabala kept troops of dogs for the purposes of war, and these used to fight in the front rank and never retreat. They were the most faithful of auxiliaries, and yet required no pay after the defeat of the cimbri their dogs defended their movable houses which were carried upon wagons when jason the lycian had been slain his dog refused to take food and died of famine when the funeral pile of king lysimachus was lightened his dog to which darius gives the name of hyrcanus threw itself into the flames and the dog of king hiero did the same philistus gives a similar account of pyrrhus the dog of the tyrant gallon among ourselves volcatius a man of rank who instructed cascalius in the civil law as he was riding on his asturian genet towards evening from his country house was attacked by a robber and was only saved by his dog the senator calius too while lying sick at placentia was surprised by armed men but received not a wound from them until they had first killed his dog but a more extraordinary fact than all took place in our own times and is testified to by the public register of the roman people in the consulship of junius and Silius, when titius sabinus was put to death together with his slaves for the affair of nero the son of germanicus it was found impossible to drive away a dog which belonged to one of them from the prison nor could it be forced away from the body which had been cast down the gematorian steps but there it stood howling in the presence of vast multitudes of people and when someone threw a piece of bread to it the animal carried it to the mouth of its master afterwards when the body was thrown into the tiber the dog swam into the river and endeavoured to raise it out of the water quite a throng of people gathered to witness this instance of an animal's fidelity dogs are the only animals that are sure to know their masters and if they suddenly meet him as a stranger they will instantly recognise him they are the only animals that will answer to their names and recognise the voices of the family they recollect a road along which they have passed however long it may be next to man there is no living creature whose memory is so retentive by sitting down on the ground we may arrest their most impetuous attack even when prompted by the most violent rage in daily life we have discovered many other valuable qualities in this animal but its intelligence and sagacity are more especially shown in the chase it discovers and traces out the tracks of the animal leading by the leash the sportsman who accompanies it straight up to the prey and as soon as it has perceived it how silent it is and how secret but significant is the indication which it gives 
first by the tail and afterwards by the nose. Oftentimes, even when worn out with old age, blind and feeble, they are carried by the huntsman in his arms, being still able to point out the coverts where the game is concealed, by snuffing with their muzzles at the wind. Among the Gauls, their packs of hounds have, each of them, one dog who acts as the guide and leader. This dog they follow in the chase, and him they carefully obey, for these animals have even a notion of subordination among themselves. It is asserted that the dogs keep running when they drink at the Nile, for fear of becoming a prey to the voracity of the crocodile. When Alexander the Great was on his Indian expedition, he was presented by the king of Albania with a dog of unusual size. Being greatly delighted with its noble appearance, he ordered bears, and after them wild boars, and then deer, to be let loose before it. But the dog lay down, and regarded them with contempt. The noble spirit of the general became irritated by the sluggishness thus manifested by an animal of such vast bulk, and he ordered it to be killed. The report of this reached the king, who accordingly sent another dog, and at the same time sent word that its powers were to be tried, not upon small animals, but upon the lion or the elephant, adding that he had had originally but two, and that if this one were put to death, the race would be extinct. Alexander, without delay, procured a lion, which in his presence was instantly torn to pieces. He then ordered an elephant to be brought, and never was he more delighted with any spectacle. For the dog, bristling up its hair all over the body, began by thundering forth a loud barking, and then attacked the animal, leaping at it first on one side and then on the other, attacking it in the most skilful manner, and then again retreating at the opportune moment, until at last the elephant, being rendered quite giddy by turning round and round, fell to the earth, and made it quite re-echo with his fall. End of Book 5, Chapter 1book five chapter two of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the horse king alexander had a very remarkable horse which was called bucephalus either on account of the fierceness of its aspect or because it had the figure of a bull's head marked on its shoulder it is said that he was struck with its beauty when it was only a boy, and that it was purchased from the stud of Philonicus, the Pharsalian, for thirteen talents. When it was equipped with the royal trappings, it would suffer no one except Alexander to mount it, although at other times it would allow any one to do so. A memorable circumstance connected with it in battle is recorded of this horse. It is said that when it was wounded in the attack upon Thebes, it would not allow Alexander to mount any other horse. Many other circumstances, of a similar nature, occurred respecting it. So that, when it died, the king duly performed its obsequies, and built around its tomb a city which he named after it. Caesar the dictator, it is said, had a horse which would allow no one to mount him but himself, and its forefeet were like those of a man. Footnote. This account is given by Suetonius, Life of Julius Caesar, Chapter 61. Cuvier suggests that the hoofs may have been notched, and that the sculptor probably exaggerated the peculiarity so as to produce the resemblance to a human foot. End of footnote. Indeed, it is thus represented in the statue before the Temple of Venus. The late Emperor Augustus also erected a tomb to his horse, on which occasion Germanicus Caesar wrote a poem, which still exists. There are at Agrigentum many tombs of horses in the form of pyramids. The Scythian horsemen make loud boasts of the fame of their cavalry. On one occasion, one of their chiefs was slain in single combat, 
and when the conqueror came to take the spoils of the enemy he was set upon by the horse of his opponent and trampled on and bitten to death their docility too is so great that we find it stated that the whole of the cavalry of the sybarite army were accustomed to perform a kind of dance to the sound of musical instruments these animals also foresee battles they lament over their masters when they have lost them and sometimes shed tears of regret for them footnote we here find pliny tripping for he has previously said that man is the only animated being that sheds tears in this book also he represents the lion as shedding tears End of footnote. when king nicomedes was slain his horse put an end to its life by fasting philarchus relates that after centaritus the galatian had slain antiochus in battle he took possession of his horse and mounted it in triumph upon which the animal inflamed with indignation became quite ungovernable and threw himself headlong down a precipice so that they both perished together philistus relates that a horse of dionysus once stuck fast in a morass but as soon as he disengaged himself he followed the steps of his master with a swarm of bees which had settled on his mane and that it was in consequence of this portent that dionysus gained possession of the kingdom these animals possess an intelligence which exceeds all description those who have to use the javelin are well aware how the horse by its exertions and the supple movements of its body aids the rider in any difficulty he may have in throwing his weapon they will even present to their master the weapons collected on the ground the horses too that are yoked to the chariots in the circus beyond a doubt display remarkable proofs how sensible they are to encouragement and to glory in the secular games which were celebrated in the circus under the emperor claudius when the charioteer corax who belonged to the white party footnote, there were four parties or factions of the charioteers who were named from the colour of their dress End of footnote. was thrown from his place at the starting post his horses took the lead and kept it opposing the other chariots overturning them and doing everything against the other competitors that could have been done had it been guided by the most skilful charioteer and while we quite blush to behold the skill of man excelled by that of the horse they arrived the winners at the goal after going over the whole of the prescribed course our ancestors considered it as a still more remarkable portent that when a charioteer had been thrown from his place in the plebeian games of the circus the horses ran to the capital just as if he had been standing in the car and went three times round the temple there but the greatest prodigy of all is the fact that the horses of ratumena came from vei to rome with the palm branch and chaplet he himself having fallen from his chariot after having gained the victory from which circumstance the ratumenian gate derived its name when the sarmate are about to undertake a long journey they prepare their horses for it by making them fast the day before during which they give them but little to drink by these means they are enabled to travel on horseback without stopping for one hundred and fifty miles some horses are known to live fifty years the poet virgil has very beautifully described the points which ought more especially to be looked for as constituting the perfection of a horse i myself have also treated of the same subject in my work on the use of the javelin by cavalry and i find that pretty nearly all writers are agreed respecting them the points requisite for the circus are somewhat different however and while horses are put in training for other purposes at only two years old they are not admitted to the contests of the circus before their fifth year we have an account of a horse having lived to its seventy-fifth year if a foal has lost its mother the other mares in the herd that have young will take charge of the orphan 
the more spirited a horse is, the deeper does it plunge its nose into the water while drinking. Galicia and Asturia, countries of Spain, produce a species of horse which have a peculiar pace of their own, very easy for the rider, which arises from the two legs of the same side being moved together. By studying the nature of this step, our horses have been taught the movement, which we call ambling. Marcus Varro informs us that Quintus Axius, the senator, paid for an ass the sum of four hundred thousand sesterces, or nearly sixteen thousand dollars. I am not sure whether this did not exceed the price ever given for any other animal. It is certainly a species of animal singularly useful for ploughing and other farm labour. The attachment of asses to their young is great in the extreme, but their aversion to water is still greater. They will pass through fire to get at their foals, while the very same animal, if the smallest stream intervenes, will tremble, and not dare so much as to wet even its feet. In their pastures they never drink at any but the usual watering place, and make it their care to find some dry path by which to get at it. They will not pass over a bridge either, when the water can be seen between the planks beneath. Wonderful to relate, too, if their watering places are changed, though they should be ever so thirsty, they will not drink without being either beaten or caressed. They ought always to have plenty of room for sleeping, for they are subject to various disturbances in their sleep, when they repeatedly throw out their feet, and would immediately lame themselves by coming in contact with any hard substance so that it is necessary that they should be provided with an empty space. Mycenas was the first person who had the young of the ass served up at his table. Footnote. The famous Bologna sausages are made, it is said, of ass's flesh. End of footnote. They were in those times much preferred to the onager or wild ass, but since his time the taste has gone out of fashion. The best wild asses are those of Phrygia and Laconia. Africa glories in the wild foals which she produces, as excelling all others in the flavour of their flesh. It appears from some Athenian records that a mule once lived to the age of eighty years. The people were greatly delighted with this animal, because on one occasion, when on the building of a temple in the citadel, the Parthenon, it had been left behind on account of its age. It persisted in promoting the work by accompanying and assisting them, in consequence of which a decree was passed that the dealers in corn were not to drive it away from their sieves. End of Book 5, Chapter 2《The Boys and Girls Pliny》by Pliny the Elder。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ox We find it stated that the oxen of India are of the height of camels, and that the extremities of their horns are four feet apart. In our part of the world, the most valuable oxen are those of Epirus, owing, it is said, to the attention paid to their breed by King Pyrrhus. He brought them to a very large size, and descendants of this breed are to be seen at the present day. The ox is the only animal that walks backwards while it is feeding. Among the Garamantes, they feed in no other manner. Footnote. This peculiarity in their mode of taking their food is mentioned by Herodotus, who ascribed it to the extraordinary length of the horns. End of footnote. Cattle that are bred in the Alps, although very small of body, give a great quantity of milk, and are capable of enduring much labour. They are yoked by the horns and not by the neck. The oxen of Syria have no dewlap, but have a hump on the back. Those of Caria in Asia are unsightly in appearance, having a hump hanging over the shoulders from the neck, and their horns are movable. 
They are said, however, to be excellent workers, though those which are either black or white are condemned as worthless for labor. Oxen must be broken when they are three years old. After that it is too late, and before too early. The ox is most easily broken by yoking it with a trained animal. The ox is our closest companion, both in labor generally, and in the operations of agriculture. Our ancestors considered it of so much value that there is an instance cited of a man being brought before the Roman people on a day appointed, and condemned for having killed an ox, in order to humor the whim of his wife, who said that she had never tasted tripe, and he was driven into exile, just as though he had killed one of his own peasants. The bull has a proud air, a stern forehead, shaggy ears, and horns which appear always ready, and challenging to the combat. But it is by his forefeet that he manifests his threatening anger. As his rage increases, he stands, lashing back his tail every now and then, and throwing up the sand against his belly, being the only animal that excites himself by these means. We have seen them fight at the word of command, and shown as a public spectacle. These bulls whirled about and then fell upon their horns, and at once were up again. Then at other times they would lie upon the ground and let themselves be lifted up. They would even stand in a two-horsed chariot, while moving at a rapid rate, like so many charioteers. The people of Thessaly invented a method of killing bulls by means of a man on horseback who would ride up to them and seize one of the horns and so twist their neck. Caesar the dictator was the first person who exhibited this spectacle at Rome. Bulls are selected as the very choicest of victims and are offered up as the most approved sacrifice for appeasing the gods. Of all the animals that have long tails, this is the only one whose tail is not of proportionate length at birth, and in this animal alone it continues to grow until it reaches its heels. It is on this account that in making choice of a calf for a victim, due care is taken that its tail reaches to the postern joint. If it is shorter than this, the sacrifice is not deemed acceptable to the gods. This fact has also been remarked that calves, which have been carried to the altar on men's shoulders, are not generally acceptable to the gods, and also if they are lame, or of a species which is not appropriate, or if they struggle to get away from the altar. It was not an uncommon prodigy among the ancients for an ox to speak. Upon such a fact being announced to the senate, they were in the habit of holding a meeting in the open air. End of Book 5, Chapter 3book five chapter four of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the egyptian apis in egypt an ox is even worshipped as a deity they call it apis it is distinguished by a conspicuous white spot on the right side in the form of a crescent there is a knot also under the tongue, which is called cantharus. This ox is not allowed to live beyond a certain number of years, but is then destroyed by being drowned in the fountain of the priests. They then go amid general mourning and seek another ox to replace it, and the mourning is continued with their heads shaved until such time as they have found one. It is not long, however, at any time, before they meet with a successor. When one has been found, it is brought by the priests to Memphis. There are two temples appropriated to it, which are called Thalami, and to these the people resort to learn the auguries. According as the ox enters the one or the other of these places, the augury is deemed favorable or unfavorable. It gives answers to individuals, by taking food from the hand of those who consult it. 
it turned away from the hand of Germanicus Caesar, who died not long after. It commonly lives in secret, but when it comes forth in public, the multitudes make way for it, and it is attended by a crowd of boys, singing hymns in honor of it. It appears to be sensible of the adoration thus paid to it, and to court it. These crowds, too, suddenly become inspired, and predict future events. There is a spot in the Nile, near Memphis, which, from its figure, they call Fayela, the goblet. Here they throw into the water a dish of gold, and another of silver, every year upon the days on which they celebrate the birth of Apis. These days are seven in number, and it is a remarkable thing that during this time no one is ever attacked by the crocodile. On the eighth day, however, after the sixth hour, these beasts resume all their former ferocity. End of Book 5, Chapter 4book five chapter five of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone sheep and their wool many thanks do we owe to the sheep both for appeasing the gods and for giving us the use of its fleece as oxen cultivate the fields which yield food for man so to sheep are we indebted for the defence of our bodies there are two principal kinds of sheep the covered and the colonic or common sheep the former is the more tender animal but the latter is more nice about its pastures for the covered sheep will feed even on brambles the best coverings for sheep are brought from arabia the most esteemed wool of all is that of apulia and that which in Italy is called Grecian wool, in other countries Italian. The fleeces of Miletus hold the third rank. The Apulian wool is shorter in the hair, and owes its high character to the cloaks that are made of it. That which comes from the vicinity of Tarentum and Canusium is the most celebrated, and there is a wool from Laodicea in Asia of a similar quality, there is no white wool superior to that of the countries bordering on the Pados, nor up to the present day, nor up to the present day, has any wool exceeded the price of one hundred sesterces, or about four dollars, per pound. The sheep are not shorn in all countries. In some places it is still the custom to pull off the wool. There are so many various colors of wool that we lack terms to express them all. Polencia, in the vicinity of the Alps, produces black fleeces of the best quality. Asia, the red fleeces. Those of Canusium are of a tawny color, and those of Tarentum have a peculiar dark tint. The wool of Istria is much more like hair than wool, and is not suitable for the fabrication of stuffs upon which a long nap is required. The thick, flocky wool has been esteemed for the manufacture of carpets from the very earliest times. It is quite clear, from what we read in Homer, that they were in use in his time. Some kinds of wool are compressed for making a felt, which, if soaked in vinegar, is capable of resisting iron even. Footnote. I have macerated unbleached flax in vinegar saturated with salt and after compression have obtained a felt, with a power of resistance quite comparable with that of the famous armour of Conrad of Montferrat, for neither the point of a sword, nor even balls discharged from firearms, were able to penetrate it. Memoir on the Substance Called Pelina by Papadopoulo Fretos End of footnote And what is still more, after having gone through the last process, wool will even resist fire. The refuse, too, when taken out of the fat of the scourer, is used for making mattresses, an invention, I fancy, of the Gauls. At all events, it is by Gallic names that we distinguish the various sorts of mattresses at the present day, 
but i am not well able to say at what period wool began to be employed for this purpose our ancestors made use of straw for the purpose of sleeping upon just as they do at present when in camp the gosapa footnote the gosapa or gosapum was a kind of thick cloth very woolly on one side and used especially for covering tables and beds and making cloaks to keep out the wet and cold the wealthier romans had it made of the finest wool and usually of a purple colour it seems also to have been sometimes made of linen but still with a rough surface End of footnote. the gosapa has been brought into use in my father's memory and i myself recollect the amphimala footnote from amphimala napped on both sides they probably resemble our bases or druggets or perhaps the modern blanket End of footnote. and the long shaggy apron being introduced but at the present day the lataclave tunic is begun to be manufactured in imitation of the gossapa footnote about the time of augustus the romans began to exchange the toga which had previously been their ordinary garment for the more convenient lacerna and penula which were less encumbered with folds and better adapted for the usual occupations of life and a footnote black wool will take no colour end of book five chapter five book five chapter six of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain different kinds of cloths varro informs us as an eye-witness that in the temple of sancus the wool was still preserved on the distaff and spindle of tanaquil who was also called caia Cicilia. footnote according to the commonly received account tanaquil was the wife of tarquinius priscus and a native of etruria when she removed to rome and her husband became king her name was changed to Caia Caecilia. End of footnote. And he says that the royal waved or watered toga, formerly worn by Servius Tullius, and now in the Temple of Fortune, was made by her. Hence was derived the custom, on the marriage of a young woman, of carrying in the procession a dressed distaff and spindle, with a thread arranged upon it tanaquil was the first who wove the straight tunic such as our young people and newly married women wear with the white toga waved garments were at first the most esteemed of all after which those composed of various colours came into vogue fenestella informs us that togas with a smooth surface as well as the frixian togas of crisp and crinkly wool began to be used in the latter part of the reign of augustus the praetexta footnote the praetexta is described by varro as a white toga with a purple band or border it was worn by boys until their seventeenth year and by young women until their marriage and a footnote the praetexta had its origin among the etrurians i find that the trabea was first worn by the kings footnote the trabea differed from the praetexta in being ornamented with stripes trabes of purple whence its name End of footnote. embroidered garments are mentioned by homer footnote helen is introduced iliad book three one one twenty five wearing an embroidered garment in which were figured the battles of the greeks and trojans it was probably somewhat of the nature of modern tapestry and a footnote and in this class originated the triumphal robes the phrygians first used the needle for this purpose and hence this kind of garment obtained the name of phrygian king attalus who also lived in asia invented the art of embroidering with gold from which these garments have been called attalic 
Babylon was very famous for making embroidery in different colors, so that stuffs of this kind have obtained the name of Babylonian. The method of weaving cloth with more than two threads was invented at Alexandria, and in Gaul cloths were first woven into checkered plants. Metellus Scipio, in the accusation which he brought against Cato, stated that even in his time Babylonian covers for couches were selling for 800,000 sesterces, and these of late, in the time of the emperor Nero, had risen to four millions. Footnote. The first sum amounts to about $23,000, the latter to $115,000. End of footnote. The pretexte of Servius Tullius, with which the statue of Fortune, dedicated by him, was covered, lasted until the death of Sejanus, and it is a remarkable fact that during a period of five hundred and sixty years they had never faded or received injury from moths. I myself have seen the fleece upon the living animal dyed in strips of three colours purple, scarlet, and violet, a pound and a half of dye being used for each, just as though they had been produced by nature in this form to meet the demands of luxury. In the sheep it is considered a proof of its being a very fair breed when the legs are short and the belly is covered with wool. When this part is bare they are looked upon as worthless. The tail of the Syrian sheep is a cubit in length, and upon that part most of the wool is found. End of Book 5, Chapter 6。Book 5, Chapter 7 of The Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Goats. Some of these animals have no horns, but where there are horns, the age of the animal is denoted by the number of knots on them. In Cilicia, and in the vicinity of the Syrtes, the inhabitants shear the goat for the purpose of clothing themselves. It is said that the she-goats in the pastures will never look at each other at sunset, but lie with their backs towards one another while at other times of the day they lie facing each other and in family groups. They all have long hair hanging down from the chin. If any one of the flock is taken hold of and dragged by this hair, all the rest gaze on in stupid astonishment. Mutianus relates an instance of the intelligence of this animal, of which he himself was an eye-witness. Two goats, coming from opposite directions, met on a very narrow bridge, which would not admit of either of them turning round, and in consequence of its great length they could not safely go backwards, there being no sure footing on account of its narrowness, while at the same time an impetuous torrent was rapidly rushing beneath. Accordingly, one of the animals lay down flat, while the other walked over it. End of Book 5, Chapter 7 Book Six, Chapter One of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Book Six, The Natural History of Fishes, Chapter One: Why the Largest Animals Are Found in the Sea. We have now given an account of the animals which we call terrestrial and which live, as it were, in a sort of society with man. Among the remaining ones, it is well known that the birds are the smallest. We shall therefore first describe those which inhabit the seas, rivers, and standing waters. Among these there are many to be found that exceed in size any of the terrestrial animals, the evident cause of which is the superabundance of moisture with which they are supplied. Very different is the lot of the winged animals, whose life is passed soaring aloft in the air. But in the seas, spread out as they are far and wide, forming an element at once so delicate and so vivifying, 
many animals are to be found of monstrous form hence it is that the vulgar notion may very possibly be true that whatever is produced in any other department of nature is to be found in the sea as well while at the same time many other productions are there to be found which nowhere else exist that there are to be found in the sea the forms not only of terrestrial animals but of inanimate objects is easy to be understood by all who will take the trouble to examine the grape-fish the sword-fish the saw-fish and the cucumber-fish which last so strongly resembles the real cucumber both in colour and in smell we shall find the less reason then to be surprised to find that in so small an object as a shellfish the head of the horse is to be seen protruding from the shell but the largest and most numerous of all these animals are those found in the indian seas among which there are balene four jugera in extent and the pristes two hundred cubits long here also are found crayfish four cubits in length and in the river ganges there are to be seen eels three hundred feet long footnote these are all of course excessive exaggerations End of footnote. but at sea more especially about the time of the solstices these monsters are to be seen for then in these regions the whirlwinds blow the rains descend the hurricane comes rushing down hurled from the mountain heights while the sea is stirred up from the very bottom and the monsters are driven from their depths and rolled upwards on the crest of the billow once upon a time the fleet of alexander the great met with such vast multitudes of tunnies that he was able to make head against them only by facing them in order of battle just as he would have done an enemy's fleet had the ships not done this but proceeded in a straggling manner they could not possibly have made their escape no noises no sounds no blows had any effect on these fish by nothing short of the clash of battle were they to be terrified and by nothing less than their utter destruction were they overpowered there is a large peninsula in the red sea known by the name of Kadara. as it projects into the deep it forms a vast gulf which it took the fleet of king ptolemy twelve whole days and nights to traverse by dint of rowing for not a breath of wind was to be perceived in the recesses of this becalmed spot more particularly the sea monsters attain so vast a size that they are quite unable to move the commanders of the fleets of alexander the great have related that the gedrosi who dwell upon the banks of the river arabis are in the habit of making the doors of their houses with the jawbones of fish and raftering the roofs with their bones many of which were found as much as forty cubits in length footnote Hardouin remarks that the Basques of his day were in the habit of fencing their gardens with the ribs of the whale, which sometimes exceeded twenty feet in length, and Cuvier says that at the present time the jawbone of the whale is used in Norway for the purpose of making beams or posts for buildings. End of footnote. At this place, too, the sea monsters, just like so many cattle, were in the habit of coming on shore and after feeding on the roots of shrubs they would return some of them which had the heads of horses asses and bulls found a pasture in the crops of grain the largest animals found in the indian sea are the pistrix and the balena while of the gallic ocean the physeter or blower is the most bulky inhabitant raising itself aloft like some vast column and as it towers above the sails of ships belching forth as it were a deluge of water in the ocean of gades there is a tree with outspread branches so vast that it is supposed that it is for that reason it has never yet entered the straits there are fish also found there which are called sea-wheels in consequence of their singular conformation 
they are divided by four spokes the nave being guarded on every side by a couple of eyes end of book six chapter one book six chapter two of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the forms of the tritons and nereids a deputation of persons from olisipo lisbon that had been sent for the purpose brought word to the emperor tiberius that a triton had been both seen and heard in a certain cavern blowing a conch shell and of the form under which they are usually represented footnote hardouin with excessive credulity says that it is no fable that the narrates and tritons had a human face and says that no less than fifteen instances ancient and modern had been adduced in proof that such was the fact he says that this was the belief of scaliger and quotes the book of aldrovandus on monsters but as cuvier remarks it is impossible to explain these stories of narrates and tritons on any other grounds than the fraudulent pretenses of those who have exhibited them or asserted that they have seen them it was only last year he says that all london was resorting to see a wonderful sight in what is commonly called a mermaid i myself had the opportunity of examining a very similar object it was the body of a child in the mouth of which they had introduced the jaws of asperus or gilt head while for the legs was substituted the body of a lizard the body of the london mermaid he says was that of an ape and the fish attached to it supplied the place of the hind legs and the footnote nor is the figure generally attributed to the narrates at all a fiction only in them the portion of the body that resembles the human figure is still rough all over with scales for one of these creatures was seen upon the same shores and as it died its plaintive murmurs were heard by the inhabitants at a distance the legatus of gaul too wrote word to the late emperor augustus that a considerable number of narrates had been found dead upon the seashore i have too some distinguished informants of equestrian rank who state that they themselves once saw in the ocean of gades a seaman which bore in every part of his body a perfect resemblance to a human being and that during the night he would climb up into ships upon which the side of the vessel where he seated himself would instantly sink downward and if he remained there any considerable time even go under water in the reign of the emperor tiberius a subsidence of the ocean left exposed on the shores of an island which faces the province of lugdunum as many as three hundred animals or more all at once quite marvellous for their very shapes and enormous size and no less a number upon the shores of the santonies among the rest there were elephants and rams which last however had only a white spot to represent horns tyrannius had also left accounts of several narrates and he speaks of a monster that was thrown up on the shore at gades the distance between the two fins at the end of the tail of which was sixteen cubits and its teeth one hundred and twenty in number the largest being nine and the smallest six inches in length marcus scaurus in his aedile ship exhibited at rome among other wonderful things the bones of the monster to which andromeda was said to have been exposed and which he had brought from joppa a city of judea these bones exceeded forty feet in length and the ribs were higher than those of the indian elephant while the backbone was a foot and a half in thickness End of book six chapter two book six chapter three of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Balena and the Orca The Balena penetrates even to our seas. It is said that they are not to be seen in the oceans of Gades before the winter solstice, and that at periodical seasons they retire and conceal themselves in some calm capacious bay. This fact, however, is known to the orca, an animal which is peculiarly hostile to the balena, and the form of which cannot be in any way adequately described, but as an enormous mass of flesh armed with teeth. This animal attacks the balena with its young, in its places of retirement, and as they turn to defend themselves, it pierces them just as though they had been attacked by the beak of a Liburnian galley. The balenae, devoid of all flexibility, without energy to defend themselves, are well aware that their only resource is to take to flight in the open sea and to range over the whole face of the ocean, while the orca, on the other hand, do all in their power to meet them in their flight, throw themselves in their way, and either kill them cooped up in a narrow passage, or else drive them on a shoal, or dash them to pieces against the rocks. When these battles are witnessed, it appears just as though the sea were infuriated against itself. Not a breath of wind may be felt in the bay, and yet the waves, by their pantings and their repeated blows, will be heaved aloft in a way which no whirlwind could effect. An orca has been seen even in the port of Ostia, where it was attacked by the Emperor Claudius. While he was constructing the harbour there, an orca came, attracted by some hides brought from Gaul, which had happened to fall overboard there. Feeding upon these for several days, it had quite glutted itself, and hollowed out a channel in the shoal water. Here the sand was thrown up by the action of the wind to such an extent that the creature found it quite impossible to turn round, and while in the act of pursuing its prey, it was propelled by the waves towards the shore, so that its back came to be perceived above the level of the water, very much resembling in appearance the keel of a vessel turned bottom upwards. Upon this, Caesar ordered a great number of nets to be extended across the mouth of the harbour from shore to shore, while he himself went there with the praetorian cohorts, affording a spectacle to the Roman people, for boats assailed the monster, while the soldiers on board showered lances upon it. I myself saw one of the boats sunk by the water, which the animal, as it respired, showered down upon it. End of Book 6, Chapter 3book six chapter four of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone dolphins the swiftest not only of the sea animals but of all animals whatever is the dolphin footnote in his description of the dolphin pliny has confused the peculiarities of the seal the porpoise, the flying fish, and the squalus with those of the dolphin. End of footnote. He is more rapid in his movements than a bird, more swift than the flight of an arrow, and were it not for the fact that his mouth is much below his muzzle, almost indeed in the middle of the belly, not a fish would be able to escape his pursuit. But nature, in her prudence, has thrown certain impediments in his way for unless he turns and throws himself on his back he can seize nothing and it is this circumstance more especially that gives proof of his extraordinary swiftness for if pressed by hunger he will follow a fish as it flies down to the very bottom of the water and then after holding his breath thus long will dart again to the surface to breathe with the speed of an arrow discharged from a bow, and often, on such occasions, he is known to leap out of the water with such a bound as to fly right over the sails of a ship. 
dolphins generally go in couples they suckle their young like the balina and even carry them during the weakness of infancy in addition to which they accompany them long after they are grown up so great is their affection for their progeny the young ones grow very speedily and in ten years arrive at their full size the dolphin lives thirty years a fact that has been ascertained from cutting marks on the tail by way of experiment it conceals itself for thirty days at about the rising of the dog star so effectually that it is not known whither it goes a thing the more surprising as it is unable to breathe under water dolphins are in the habit of darting upon the shore for some unknown reason the tongue contrary to the nature of aquatic animals in general is movable being short and broad not much unlike that of the pig instead of a voice they emit a moaning sound similar to that made by a human being the back is arched and the nose turned up for this reason they all recognize in a most surprising manner the name of simo and prefer to be called by that rather than by any other footnote he implies that the dolphin knows that it is simus or flat-nosed for which reason it is particularly fond of being called simo or flat nose a piece of good taste and intelligence remarkable even in a dolphin End of footnote. the dolphin is an animal not only friendly to man but a lover of music as well he is charmed by melodious concerts especially by the notes of the water organ he does not dread man as though a stranger to him but comes to meet ships leaps and bounds to and fro vies with them in swiftness and passes them when in full sail in the reign of the late emperor augustus a dolphin which had been carried to the lucrine lake conceived a most wonderful affection for the child of a certain poor man who was in the habit of going that way from baie to puteoli to school and who used to stop there in the middle of the day call him by his name of simo and would often entice him to the banks of the lake with pieces of bread which he carried for the purpose i should really have felt ashamed to mention this had not the incident been stated in writing in the works of maecenas fabianus flavius alpheus and many others at whatever hour of the day he might happen to be called by the boy and although hidden and out of sight at the bottom of the water he would instantly fly to the surface and after feeding from his hand would present his back for him to mount taking care to conceal the spiny projection of his fins in their sheath as it were and so sportively taking him up on his back he would carry him over a wide expanse of sea to the school at Puteoli, and in a similar manner bring him back again. This happened for several years, until at last the boy happened to fall ill of some malady, and died. The dolphin came again and again to the spot as usual, with a sorrowful air and manifesting every sign of deep affliction, until at last a thing of which no one felt the slightest doubt he died purely of sorrow and regret within a few years another dolphin at hippo diaretus on the coast of africa in a similar manner used to receive his food from the hands of various persons present himself for their caresses sport about among the swimmers and carry them on his back on being rubbed with unguents by Flavianus, the proconsul of Africa, he was lulled to sleep, as it appeared, by the sensation of an odour so new to him, and floated about just as though he had been dead. For some months after this, he carefully avoided all intercourse with man, as though he had received some affront or other. But at the end of that time he returned, and afforded the same wonderful scenes as before at last 
the vexations that were caused them by having to entertain so many influential men who came to see this sight compelled the people of hippo to put the animal to death before this there was a similar story told of a child at the city of iasus for whom a dolphin was long observed to have conceived a most ardent affection until one day the animal eagerly following him as he was making for the shore was carried by the tide on the sands and there expired alexander the great appointed this boy high priest of neptune at babylon interpreting this extraordinary attachment as a convincing proof of the favour of that divinity hegesidamus informs us that in the same city of iasus there was a boy hermias by name who in a similar manner used to traverse the sea on a dolphin's back but that on one occasion a tempest suddenly arising he lost his life and was brought back dead upon which the dolphin who thus admitted that he had been the cause of his death would not return to the sea but lay down upon the dry land and there expired theophrastus tells us that the very same thing happened at nopactus nor in fact is there any limit to similar instances the amphilochians and the tarentines have similar stories about children and dolphins and all these give an air of credibility to the one that is told of arion the famous performer on the lyre the mariners being on the point of throwing him into the sea for the purpose of taking possession of the money he had earned he prevailed upon them to allow him one more song accompanied with the music of his lyre the melody attracted numbers of dolphins around the ship and upon throwing himself into the sea he was taken up by one of them and borne in safety to the shore of the promontory of tenarum footnote ovid tells the story of arion more fully and in beautiful language in the fasti book two one ninety two and the footnote there is in the province of gallia narbonensis and in the territory of nemausus a lake known by the name of latera where dolphins fish in company with men at the narrow outlet of this lake at stated seasons of the year innumerable multitudes of mullets make their way into the sea taking advantage of the turn of the tide hence it is quite impossible to employ nets sufficiently strong to bear so vast a weight even though the fish had not the instinctive shrewdness to watch their opportunity by a similar instinct the fish immediately make with all speed towards the deep water which is found in a gulf in that vicinity and hasten to escape from the only spot that is at all convenient for spreading the nets as soon as the fishermen perceive this all the people for great multitudes resort thither being well aware of the proper time and especially desirous of sharing in the amusement shout out as loud as they can and summon simo to the scene of action the dolphins very quickly understand that they are in requisition as a north-east wind speedily carries the sound to their retreats though a south one would somewhat retard it by carrying it in an opposite direction even then however sooner than you could have possibly supposed there are the dolphins in all readiness to assist they are seen approaching in haste in battle array and immediately taking up their position when the engagement is about to take place they cut off all escape to the open sea and drive the terrified fish into shallow water the fishermen then throw their nets holding them up at the sides with forks though the mullets with inconceivable agility instantly leap over them while the dolphins on the other hand are waiting in readiness to receive them and content themselves for the present with killing them only postponing all thoughts of eating till after they have secured the victory the battle waxes hot apace and the dolphins pressing on with the greatest vigour readily allow themselves to be enclosed in the nets 
but in order that the fact of their being thus enclosed may not urge the enemy to find additional means of flight they glide along so stealthily among the boats and nets or else the swimmers as not to leave them any opening for escape not one among them attempts to make its escape by leaping which at other times is their favourite amusement except when the nets are purposely lowered for it and even after it has come out it continues the battle as it were up to the very ramparts at last when the capture is now completed they devour those among the fish which they have killed but being well aware that they have given too active an assistance to be repaid with only one day's reward they take care to wait there till the following day when they are filled not only with fish but bread-crumbs soaked in wine the account which musianus gives of a similar mode of fishing in the iasian gulf differs from the preceding one in the fact that there the dolphins make their appearance of their own accord and do not require to be called they receive their share from the hands of the people each boat having its own particular associate among the dolphins and this although the fishing is carried on at night-time by the light of torches dolphins also form among themselves a sort of general community once when one of them had been captured by a king of caria and chained up in the harbour great multitudes of dolphins assembled at the spot and with signs of sorrow which could not be misunderstood appealed to the sympathies of the people until at last the king ordered it to be released the young dolphins are always attended by a larger one who acts as a guardian to them and before now they have been seen carrying off the body of one which had died that it might not be devoured by the sea monsters End of book six chapter four Book Six, Chapter Five of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The various kinds of turtles. The Indian Sea produces turtles of such vast size that with the shell of a single animal they are able to roof a habitable cottage, and among the islands of the Red Sea the navigation is mostly carried on in boats formed of these shells they are to be caught in many ways but they are generally taken when they have come up to the surface of the water just before midday a season at which they experience great delight in floating on the calm surface with the back entirely out of the water here the delightful sensations which attend a free respiration beguile them to such a degree and render them so utterly regardless of their safety that their shell becomes so dried up by the heat of the sun that they are unable to descend and having to float against their will become an easy prey to the fishermen it is said also that they leave the water at night for the purpose of feeding and eat with such avidity as to glut themselves upon which they become weary and on their return in the morning to the sea they fall asleep on the surface of the water the noise of their snoring betrays them upon which the fishermen stealthily swim towards the animals three to each turtle two of them in a moment throw it on its back while a third slings a noose around it as it lies face upwards and then more men who are ready on shore draw it to land in the phoenician sea they are taken without the slightest difficulty and at stated periods of the year come of their own accord to the river eleutherus in immense numbers the turtle has no teeth but the edge of the mouth is sharp the upper part shutting down over the lower like the lid of a box in the sea it lives upon shellfish and such is the strength of its jaws that it is able to break stones when on shore it feeds upon herbage the female turtle lays eggs like those of birds one hundred in number 
these she buries on the dry land covers them over with earth pats it down with her breast and sits on them during the night the young are hatched in the course of a year some persons are of opinion that they hatch their eggs by means of the eyes by merely looking at them the troglodytae have turtles with horns which resemble the branches of a lyre footnote according to cuvier the forefeet were here taken for horns being in the turtle long narrow and pointed End of footnote. they are large but movable and assist the animal like so many oars while swimming the name of this fine but rarely found turtle is kelion for the rocks from the sharpness of their points frighten away the kelonophagi while the troglodytae whose shores these animals frequent worship them as sacred there are some land turtles the shells of which are used for the purposes of art they are found in the deserts of africa in the part where the scorched sands are more especially destitute of water and subsist it is believed upon the moisture of the dews no other animal is to be found there carvilius pollio a man of prodigal habits and ingenious in inventing the refinements of luxury was the first to cut the shell of the tortoise into laminae or thin slices and to veneer beds and cabinets with it End of book six chapter five book six chapter six of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone distribution of aquatic animals into various species the integuments of the aquatic animals are many in number some are covered with the hide and hair as the sea calf and hippopotamus for instance others again with the hide only as the dolphin others again with a shell as the turtle others with a coat as hard as a stone like the oyster and other shellfish others with a crust such as the crayfish others with a crust and spines like the sea urchin others with scales as fishes in general others with a rough skin as the squatina the skin of which is used for polishing wood and ivory others with a soft skin like the morena and others with none at all like the polypus of all aquatic animals the sea calf is killed with the greatest difficulty unless the head is cut off at once it makes a noise which sounds like lowing whence the name of sea calf the animals are susceptible however of training and with their voice as well as by gestures can be taught to salute the public when called by their name they answer with a discordant kind of grunt footnote Fremitu. from their lowing noise the french have also called these animals veaux de mer and we call them sea calves lopez de gomara one of the more recent writers on mexico in his day gave an account of an indian sea calf or a manatee as it was called by the natives that had become quite tame and answered readily to its name and although not very large it was able to bear ten men on its back he also tells us of a much more extraordinary one which aldrovandus says he himself had seen at bologna which would give a cheer for the christian princes when asked but would refuse to do so for the turks End of footnote. no animal has a deeper sleep than this on dry land it creeps along as though on feet by the aid of what it uses as fins when in the sea its skin even when separated from the body is said to retain a certain sensitive sympathy with the sea and at the reflux of the tide the hair on it always rises upright in addition to which 
it is said that there is in the right fin a certain soporiferous influence and that if placed under the head it induces sleep there are one hundred and seventy-four species of fishes exclusive of the crustacea of which there are thirty kinds footnote there are specimens of about six thousand kinds of fishes in the cabinet du roi in paris and the footnote tunnies are among the most remarkable for their size we have found one weighing as much as fifteen talents twelve hundred pounds the breadth of its tail being five cubits and a palm in some of the rivers also there are fish of no less size such for instance as the silurus of the nile the isox of the rhine and the acelus of the po which naturally of an inactive nature sometimes grows so fat as to weigh a thousand pounds and when taken with a hook attached to a chain requires a yoke of oxen to draw it on land an extremely small fish which is known as the clupea attaches itself with a wonderful tenacity to a certain vein in the throat of the atlas and destroys it by its bite the silurus carries devastation with it wherever it goes attacks every living creature and often drags beneath the water horses as they swim it is also remarkable that in the river main of germany a fish that bears a very strong resemblance to the sea pig requires to be drawn out of the water by a yoke of oxen and in the danube it is taken with large hooks of iron in the borestinis also there is said to be a fish of enormous size the flesh of which has no bones or spines in it and is remarkable for its sweetness in the ganges a river in india there is a fish found which they call the platanista it has the muzzle and the tail of a dolphin and measures sixteen cubits in length stitius sebosus says a thing that is marvellous in no small degree that in the same river there are fishes found called worms these have two gills and are sixty cubits in length they are of an azure colour and have received their name from their peculiar conformation these fish he says are of such enormous strength that with their teeth they seize hold of the trunks of elephants that come to drink and so drag them into the water the black sea is never entered by any animal that is noxious to fish with the exception of the sea calf and the small dolphin on entering the tunnies range along the shores to the right and on departing keep to those on the left this is supposed to arise from the fact that they have better sight with the right eye their powers of vision with either being naturally very limited in the channel of the thracian bosporus by which the propontis is connected with the black sea at the narrowest part of the straits which separate europe from asia there is near chalcedon on the asiatic side a rock of remarkable whiteness the whole of which can be seen from the bottom of the sea alarmed at the sudden appearance of this rock the tunnies always hasten in great numbers and with headlong impetuosity towards the promontory of byzantium which stands exactly opposite to it and from this circumstance has received the name of the golden horn footnote he means that in consequence of the lucrative nature of this fishery it thence obtained the name of the golden horn End of footnote. hence it is that all the fishing is at byzantium to the great loss of chalcedon although it is only separated from it by a channel a mile in width they wait however for the blowing of the north wind to leave the black sea with a favourable tide and are never taken until they have entered the harbour of byzantium these fish do not move about in winter in whatever place they may happen to be surprised by it there they pass the winter till the time of the equinox manifesting a wonderful degree of delight 
they will often accompany a vessel in full sail and may be seen from the deck following it for hours over a distance of several miles if a fish spare is thrown at them never so many times they are not in the slightest degree alarmed at it some writers call the tunnies which follow ships in this manner by the name of pompili or pilot fish End of book six chapter six book six chapter seven of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone fishes valued for the table at the present day the first place in point of delicacy is given to the scarus the only fish that is said to ruminate and to feed on grass and not on other fish it is mostly found in the carpathian sea and never of its own accord passes lectum a promontory of troas optatus elipertius the commander of the fleet under the emperor claudius had this fish brought from that locality and dispersed in various places off the coast between ostia and the districts of campania during five years the greatest care was taken that those which were caught should be returned to the sea but since then they have been always found in great abundance off the shores of italy where formerly there were none to be taken thus has gluttony introduced these fish to be a dainty within its reach and added a new inhabitant to the seas so that we ought to feel no surprise that foreign birds breed at rome the fish that is next in estimation for the table is the mustela but that is valued only for its liver a singular thing to tell of the lake of brigantia the modern lake constance in Rhaetia, lying in the midst of the alps produces them to rival even those of the sea of the remaining fish that are held in any degree of esteem the mullet is the most highly valued as well as the most abundant of all it is of only a moderate size rarely exceeds two pounds in weight and will never grow beyond that weight in preserves or fish ponds these fish are only to be found in the northern ocean exceeding two pounds in weight and even there in none but the most westerly parts as for the other kinds the various species are numerous some live upon seaweed while others feed on the oyster slime and the flesh of other fish the more distinctive mark is a forked beard that projects beneath the lower lip the lotarius or mud mullet is held in the lowest esteem of all this last is always accompanied by another fish known as the sargus and where the mullet stirs up the mud the other finds aliment for its own sustenance the mullet most esteemed of all has a strong flavour of shellfish the masters in gastronomy inform us that the mullet while dying assumes a variety of colours and a succession of shades and that the hue of the red scales growing paler and paler gradually changes more especially if it is looked at enclosed in glass footnote seneca has two passages on this subject which strongly bespeak the barbarous tastes of the romans he says a mullet even if just caught is thought little of unless it is allowed to die in the hand of your guest they are carried about enclosed in globes of glass and their colour is watched as they die ever changing by the struggles of death into various shades and hues and again there is nothing you say more beautiful than the colours of the dying mullet as it struggles and breathes forth its life it is first purple and then a paleness gradually comes over it and then placed as it is between life and death an uncertain hue comes over it End of footnote. marcus apicus a man who displayed a remarkable degree of ingenuity in everything relating to luxury was of opinion that it was a most excellent plan to let the mullet die in the pickle known as the garum of the allies 
Footnote. Seneca speaks of this cruel custom of pickling fish alive. Other fish, again, they kill in sauces, and pickle them alive. There are some persons who look upon it as quite incredible that a fish should be able to live underground. How much more so would it appear to them if they were to hear of a fish swimming in sauce, and that the chief dish of the banquet was killed at the banquet, feeding the eye before it does the gullet. End of footnote. For we find that even this has found a surname, and he proposed a prize for any one who should invent a new sauce made from the liver of this fish. I find it much easier to relate this fact than to state who it was that gained the prize. Azinius Sailor, a man of consular rank, and remarkable for his prodigal expenditure on this fish, bought one at Rome, during the reign of the Emperor Caligula, at the price of eight thousand sesterces. Footnote. Juvenal, sat four one fifteen, speaks of a mullet being bought for six thousand sesterces, a thousand for every pound, and Suetonius tells us that in the reign of Tiberius, three mullets were sold for thirty thousand sesterces. It is in allusion to this kind of extravagance that Juvenal says, in the same satire, that it is not unlikely that the fisherman could be bought as a slave for a smaller sum than the fish itself. At the above rate, each of these mullets sold for nearly four hundred dollars of our money. End of footnote. A reflection upon such a fact as this will at once lead us to turn our thoughts to those who, making loud complaints against luxury, have lamented that a single cook cost more money to buy than a horse, while at the present day a cook is only to be obtained for the same sum that a triumph would cost, and a fish is only to be purchased at what was formerly the price for a cook. Indeed, there is hardly any living being held in higher esteem than the man who understands how, in the most scientific fashion, to get rid of his master's property. Licinius Musianus relates that in the Red Sea there was caught a mullet eighty pounds in weight. What a price would have been paid for it by our epicures if it had only been found of the shores in the vicinity of our city! Eels live eight years. They are able to survive out of water as much as six days, when a northeast wind blows. But when the south wind prevails, not so many. In winter, they cannot live if they are in very shallow water, or if the water is troubled. They are taken about the rising of the Pleiades when the rivers are turbid. These animals seek their food at night. They are the only fish the bodies of which, when dead, do not float upon the surface. There is a lake called Benacus in the territory of Verona in Italy, through which the river Mincius flows. At the part of it whence this river issues, once a year, and mostly in the month of October, the lake is troubled, evidently by the constellations of autumn, and the eels are heaped together by the waves, and rolled on by them in such astonishing multitudes that single masses of them, containing more than a thousand in number, are often taken in the chambers which are formed in the bed of the river for that purpose. End of Book 6, Chapter 7「Book Six, Chapter Eight of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Peculiar Fishes In northern Gaul, the fish called Murena has on the right jaw seven spots, which bear a resemblance to the constellation of the Great Dipper, and are of a gold colour, shining as long as the animal is alive but disappearing as soon as it is dead. Vidius Pollio, a Roman of equestrian rank, and one of the friends of the late Emperor Augustus, found a method of exercising his cruelty by means of this animal, for he caused such slaves as had been condemned by him 
to be thrown into preserves filled with murinae not that the land animals would not have fully sufficed for this purpose but because he could not see a man so aptly torn to pieces all at once by any other kind of animal it is said that these fishes are driven to madness by the taste of vinegar their skin is exceedingly thin while that of the eel on the other hand is much thicker various informs us that formerly the children of the roman citizens while wearing the pretexta were flogged with eel skins there is a very small fish that is in the habit of living among the rocks and is known as the echeneus footnote apo to echean neas from holding back ships and the footnote it is believed that when this has attached itself to the keel of a ship its progress is impeded and from this circumstance it takes its name Mucianus speaks of a murex of larger size than the purple murex with a head that is neither rough nor round and the shell of which is single and falls in folds on either side he tells us also that some of these creatures once attached themselves to a ship freighted with children of noble birth and that they stopped its course in full sail trebius niger says that this fish is a foot in length and that it can retard the course of vessels five fingers in thickness besides which it has another peculiar property when preserved in salt and applied it is able to draw up gold which has fallen into a well however deep it may happen to be the only fish that builds itself a nest is the ficus it makes it of seaweed and there deposits its eggs which it defends from the attacks of enemies the sea swallow being able to fly bears a strong resemblance to the bird of that name the sea kite too flies as well there is a fish that comes up to the surface of the sea known from the following circumstance as the lantern fish thrusting from its mouth a tongue that shines like fire it emits a most brilliant light on calm nights another fish which from its horns has received its name raises them nearly a foot and a half above the surface of the water the sea dragon again if caught and thrown on the sand works out a hole for itself with its muzzle with the most wonderful celerity End of book six chapter eight book six chapter nine of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone bloodless fishes the varieties of fish which we shall now mention are those which have no blood they are of three kinds first those which are known as soft next those which have thin crusts and lastly those which are enclosed in hard shells footnote this division of the bloodless fish made first by aristotle into the mollusca testacea and crustacea has been followed by naturalists almost down to the present day End of footnote. the soft fish are the loligo the sapia the polypus and others of a similar nature the last have the head between the feet and the belly and all of them have eight feet in the sapia and the loligo two of these feet are very long and rough and by means of these they lift the food to their mouths and attach themselves to places in the sea as though with an anchor the others act as so many arms by means of which they seize their prey the loligo is able to dart about the surface of the water and the scallop does the same like an arrow as it were in the sapia the male is parti coloured blacker than the female and more courageous if the female is struck with a fish spear the male comes to her aid but the female the instant the male is struck takes to flight both of them as soon as they find themselves in danger of being caught discharge a kind of ink and thus darkening the water 
take to flight. There are numerous kinds of polypi. The land polypus is larger than that of the sea. They, all of them, use their arms as feet and hands. The polypus has a sort of passage in the back, by which it lets in and discharges the water, and which it shifts from side to side, sometimes carrying it on the right and sometimes on the left. It swims obliquely, with the head on one side, which is of surprising hardness while the animal is alive, being puffed out with air. In addition to this, they have cavities dispersed throughout the claws, by means of which, through suction, they can adhere to objects, with the head upwards, so tightly that they cannot be torn away. They cannot attach themselves, however, to the bottom of the sea, and their retentive powers are weaker in the larger ones. These are the only soft fish that come on dry land, and then only where the surface is rugged. A smooth surface they will not come near. They feed upon the flesh of shellfish, the shells of which they can easily break in the embrace of their arms. Their retreat may be easily detected by the pieces of shell which lie before it. Although, in other respects, this is looked upon as a remarkably stupid kind of animal, so much so that it will swim toward the hand of a man, in its own domestic matters it manifests considerable intelligence. It carries its prey to its home, and after eating all the flesh, throws out the debris, and then pursues such small fish as may chance to swim towards them. It also changes its colour, according to the aspect of the place where it is, and more especially when it is alarmed. The notion is entirely unfounded that it gnaws on its own arms. This mischance befalls it from the conjurers, but it is perfectly true that its arms shoot forth again, like the tail in the colotus and the lizard. Among the most remarkable curiosities among all the inhabitants of the sea is the animal which has the name of Nautilus, or, as some people call it, the Pompilos. Lying with the head upwards, it rises to the surface of the water, raising itself little by little, while, by means of a certain conduit in its body, it discharges all the water, and this being got rid of, like so much bilge water as it were, it finds no difficulty in sailing along the surface. Then, extending backwards its two front arms, it stretches out between them a membrane of marvellous thinness, which acts as a sail spread out to the wind, while with the rest of its arms it paddles along below, steering itself with its tail in the middle, which acts as a rudder. Thus does it make its way along the deep, mimicking the appearance of a light Liburnian bark, while if anything chances to cause it alarm, in an instant it draws in the water and sinks out of sight. Belonging to the genus of polypi is the animal known as the ozina, being so cold from the peculiarly strong smell exhaled by the head, in consequence of which the murani pursue it with the greatest eagerness. The polypi keep themselves concealed for two months in the year. They do not live beyond two years, and always die of consumption. I must not omit here the observations which Lucullus, the proconsul of Baetica, made with reference to the polypus, and which Trebius Niger, one of his suite, has published. He says that it is remarkably fond of shellfish, and that these, the moment that they feel themselves touched by it, close their valves and cut off the feelers of the polypus, thus making a meal at the expense of the plunderer. Shellfish are destitute of sight, as well as of all other sensations, but those which warn them of hunger and the approach of danger. Hence the polypus lies in ambush till the fish opens its shell, immediately upon which it places within it a small pebble, taking care at the same time to keep it from touching the body of the animal, lest, by making some movement, it should chance to eject it. Having made itself thus secure, it attacks its prey and draws out the flesh, while the other tries to contract itself, 
but all in vain in consequence of the separation of the shell thus affected by the insertion of the wedge so great is the instinctive shrewdness in animals that are otherwise quite remarkable for their lumpish stupidity in addition to the above the same author states that no animal in existence is more dangerous for its powers of destroying a human being when in the water embracing his body it counteracts his struggles and draws him under with its feelers and its numerous suckers when as often is the case it happens to make an attack upon a shipwrecked mariner or a child if however the animal is turned over it loses all its power for when it is thrown upon the back the arms open of themselves the other particulars which the same author has given appear still more closely to border upon the marvellous at cartea in the preserves there a polypus was in the habit of coming from the sea to the pickling tubs that were left open and devouring the fish laid in the salt for it is quite astonishing how eagerly all sea animals follow the smell of salted condiments so that for this reason the fishermen take care to rub the inside of the wicker fish kipes with them at last by its repeated thefts and immoderate depredations it drew down upon itself the wrath of the keepers of the works palisades were placed before them but these the polypus managed to get over by the aid of a tree and it was only caught at last by calling in the assistance of trained dogs which surrounded it at night as it was returning to its prey upon which the keepers awakened by the noise were struck with alarm at the novelty of the sight presented first of all the sight of the polypus was enormous beyond all conception then it was covered all over with dried brine and exhaled a most dreadful stench who could have expected to find a polypus there or could have recognized it as such under these circumstances they really thought that they were joining battle with some monster for at one instant it would drive off the dogs by its horrible fumes and lash at them with the extremities of its feelers while at another it would strike them with its stronger arms giving blows with so many clubs as it were and it was only with the greatest difficulty that it could be dispatched with the aid of a considerable number of three-pronged fish spears the head of this animal was shown to lucullus it was in size as large as a cask of fifteen amphorae and had a beard to use the expression of trebius himself which could hardly be encircled with both arms full of knots like those upon a club and thirty feet in length the suckers or calicules as large as an urn resembled a basin in shape while the teeth again were of a corresponding largeness its remains which were carefully preserved as a curiosity weighed seven hundred pounds the same author also informs us that specimens of the sapia and the loligo have been thrown up on the same shores of a size fully as large in our own seas the loligo is sometimes found five cubits in length and the sapia two these animals do not live beyond two years mucianus relates that he has seen in the propontis another curious resemblance to a ship in full sail there is a shellfish he says with a keel just like that of the vessel which we know by the name of acacium with the stern curving inwards and the prow with the beak attached in this shellfish there lies concealed also an animal known as the nauplius which bears a strong resemblance to the sapia and only adopts the shellfish as the companion of its pastimes there are two modes he says which it adopts in sailing when the sea is calm the voyager hangs down its arms and strikes the water as with a pair of oars but if the wind invites it extends them employing them by way of a helm and turning the mouth of the shell to the wind the pleasure experienced by the shellfish is that of carrying the other while the amusement of the nauplius consists in steering 
and thus at the same moment is an instinctive joy felt by these two creatures devoid as they are of all sense unless a natural antipathy to man for it is a well-known fact that to see them thus sailing along is a bad omen and that it is portentous of misfortune to those who witness it footnote probably this is merely the reproduction of the story of the nautilus with exaggerated details End of footnote. the crayfish which belongs to the class of bloodless animals is protected by a brittle crust this creature like the crab keeps itself concealed for five months but at the beginning of spring both of them after the manner of snakes throw off old age and renew their coverings while other animals swim on the water crayfish float with a kind of action like creeping they move onwards if there were nothing to alarm them in a straight line extending on each side their horns which are rounded at the point by a ball peculiar to them but when alarmed they straighten these horns and proceed with a sidelong motion they use these horns when fighting with each other the crayfish is the only animal that has the flesh in a pulpy state and not firm and solid unless it is cooked alive in boiling water the crayfish frequents rocky places the crab spots which present a soft surface in winter they both choose such parts of the shore as are exposed to the heat of the sun in summer they withdraw to the shady recesses of deep inlets of the sea all fish of this kind suffer from the cold of winter but become fat during autumn and spring particularly during the full moon for the warmth of that luminary as it shines in the night renders the temperature of the weather more moderate there are various kinds of crabs known as carabi lobsters maie bagurai heracleotisai lions and others of less note the carabus differs from other crabs in having a tail in phoenicia they are called hippoi or horses being of such extraordinary swiftness that it is impossible to overtake them crabs are long-lived and have eight feet all of which are bent obliquely besides which the animal has two claws with indented pincers the upper part only of these four feet is movable the right claw is the largest in them all sometimes they assemble together in large bodies but as they are unable to cross the mouth of the black sea they turn back again and go round by land and the road by which they travel is to be seen all beaten down with their footmarks the smallest crab known is the pinotheres it is peculiarly exposed to danger but its shrewdness is evinced by its concealing itself in the shell of the oyster removing as it grows larger to those of a larger size crabs when alarmed go backwards as swiftly as when moving forwards they fight like rams butting at each other with their horns they have a mode of curing themselves of the bites of serpents it is said that while the sun is passing through the sign of cancer the dead bodies of the crabs which are lying thrown up on the shore are transformed into serpents to the same class also belongs the sea urchin which has spines in place of feet its mode of moving along is to roll like a ball hence it is that these animals are often found with their prickles rubbed off those among them which have the longest spines of all are known by the name of echinometri while at the same time their body is the very smallest they are not all of them of the same glassy colour in the vicinity of Toron they are white with very short spines the eggs of all of them are bitter and are five in number the mouth is situated in the middle of the body and faces the earth it is said that these creatures foreknow the approach of a storm at sea and that they take up little stones with which they cover themselves and so provide a sort of ballast against their volubility 
for they are very unwilling by rolling along to wear away their prickles as soon as seafaring persons observe this they at once moor their ships with several anchors to the same genus also belong both land and water snails which thrust the body forth from their abode and extend or contract two horns they are without eyes and have therefore to feel their way by means of these horns footnote it is now known thanks to the research of some of them that the black points at the extremity of the great horns of the land snail and at the base of them in the water snail are eyes End of footnote. to the same class belong the sea scallops which also conceal themselves during severe frosts and great heats, as well as the onikes, which shine in the dark like fire, and in the mouth even while being eaten. End of Book 6, Chapter 9「ヒロコリンドロマンティック」。Long, crescent shaped, rounded into a globe, cut through into a semi globe, arched in the back, smooth, rough, indented, streaked, the upper part spirally wreathed, the edge projecting in a sharp point, the edge wreathed outwards, or else folding inwards. And then, too, there are the various distinctions of rayed shells, long haired shells, wavy haired shells. Channeled shells, pectinated shells, imbricated shells, reticulated shells, shells with lines oblique or rectilinear, thick set shells, expanded shells, tortuous shells, shells the valves of which are united by one small knot, shells which are held together all along one side, shells which are open as if in the very act of applauding, and shells which wind, resembling a conch. The fish of this class, known as the shells of Venus, are able to navigate the surface of the deep, and presenting to the wind their concave side, catch the breeze and sail along on the surface of the sea. Scallops are also able to leap and fly above the surface of the water, and they sometimes employ their shell by way of a bark. But why mention such trifles as these? when i am sensible that no greater inroads have been made upon our morals and no more rapid advances have been made by luxury than those effected through the medium of shellfish of all the elements that exist the sea is the one that costs the dearest to the stomach seeing that it provides so many kinds of meat so many dishes so many exquisite flavours derived from fish all of which are valued in proportion to the danger undergone by those who have caught them but how insignificant is all this when we come to think of our purple our azure and our pearls it was not enough forsooth for the spoils of the sea to be thrust down the gullet but they must be employed as well to adorn the hands the ears the head the whole body in fact and that of the men pretty nearly as much as the women what has the sea to do with our clothes what is there in common between waves and billows and the sheep's fleece this one element ought not to receive us according to ordinary notions except in a state of nakedness let there be ever so strong an alliance between it and the stomach on the score of gluttony still what can it possibly have to do with the back it is not enough forsooth that we are fed upon what is acquired by perils but we must be clothed too in a similar way so true it is that for all the wants of the body that which is sought at the expense of human life is sure to please us the most
End of Book Six, Chapter Ten. Book Six, Chapter Eleven of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Pearls. The very highest position among all valuables belongs to the pearl. It is principally the Indian Ocean that sends them to us. Across many a sea, and over many a lengthened tract of land, scorched by the ardent rays of a burning sun, must the pearl-seeker pass, amid those monsters so frightful and so huge which we have already described. The places most productive of pearls are the islands of Taprobana and Stoides, and Perimula, a promontory of India. But those most highly valued are found in the vicinity of Arabia, in the Persian Gulf, which forms a part of the Red Sea. The origin and production of the shellfish is not very different from that of the shell of the oyster. When the genial season of the year exercises its influence on the animal, it is said that, yawning as it were, it opens its shell, and so receives a kind of dew, by means of which it becomes permeated, and at length small, hard bunches form in its shell, in the shape of pearls, which vary according to the quality of the dew. If this has been in a perfectly pure state when it flowed into the shell, then the pearl produced is white and brilliant, but if it was turbid, the pearl is of a clouded colour also. If the sky should happen to have been lowering when it was generated, the pearl will be of a pallid colour, from all which it is quite evident that the quality of the pearl depends much more upon a calm state of the heavens than of the sea, and contracts a cloudy hue, or a limpid appearance, according to the degree of serenity of the sky in the morning. Footnote. All this theory is, of course, totally imaginary. The pearl itself is nothing else but a diversion, so to speak, of the juices, whose duty it is to line the interior of the shell, to thicken and so amplify it. And consequently, the pearl is the result of some malady. It is possible for them to be found in all shellfish, but they have no beauty in them, unless the interior of the shell, or as we call it, the mother of pearl, is lustrous and beautiful itself. Hence the finest of them come from the east, and are furnished by the kind of bivalve, called by Linnaeus, Mytilus margaritiferus, which has the most beautiful mother of pearl in the interior that is known. The parts of the Indian Sea which are mentioned by Pliny are those in which the pearl oyster is still found in the greatest abundance. End of footnote. If, again, the fish is satiated in a reasonable time, then the pearl produced increases rapidly in size. If it should happen to lighten at the time, the animal shuts its shell, and the pearl is diminished in size in proportion to the fast that the animal has to endure. But if, in addition to this, it should thunder as well, then it becomes alarmed, and closing the shell in an instant, produces what is known as a physema, or pearl bubble, filled with air, and bearing a resemblance to a pearl, but in appearance only, as it is quite empty and devoid of body. Those which are produced in a perfectly healthy state consist of numerous layers. It is wonderful, however, that they should be influenced thus pleasurably by the state of the heavens, seeing that by the action of the sun the pearls are turned of a red colour and lose all their whiteness just like the human body those which keep their whiteness the best are the pelagiae or main sea pearls which lie at too great a depth to be reached by the sun's rays those pearls which have one surface flat and the other spherical opposite to the plain side are for that reason called tympania or tambour pearls. I have seen pearls still adhering to the shell, for which reason the shells were used as boxes for unguents. As soon as the fish perceives the hand, it shuts its shell and covers up its treasures, 
being well aware what is sought. If it happens to catch the fingers, it cuts them off with the sharp edge of the shell. No punishment could be more justly inflicted. There are other penalties as well, for while the greater part of the pearls are only to be found among rocks and crags, the others, which lie out in the main sea, are generally accompanied by sea dogs. Footnote Procopius tells a wonderful story in relation to this subject. He says that the sea dogs are wonderful admirers of the pearl fish and follow them out to sea, that when the sea dogs are pressed by hunger, they go in quest of prey and then return to the shellfish and gaze upon it. A certain fisherman, having watched for the moment when the shellfish was deprived of the protection of its attendant sea dog, which was seeking its prey, seized the shellfish and made for the shore the sea dog however was soon aware of the theft and making straight for the fisherman seized him finding himself thus caught he made a last effort and threw the pearl fish on shore upon which he was immediately torn to pieces by its protector End of footnote. and yet for all this, the women will not banish these gems from their ears. Some writers say that these animals live in communities, or swarms like bees, each of them being governed by one remarkable for its size and venerable age, while at the same time it is possessed of marvellous skill in taking all due precautions against danger. The divers take special care to find these, because when once they are taken, the others stray to and fro, and are easily caught in their nets. When the pearl fish are taken, they are placed under a thick layer of salt in earthenware vessels. As the flesh is gradually consumed, the pearls are disengaged and fall to the bottom of the vessel. There is no doubt that pearls wear out with use, and will change their colour if neglected. All their merit consists in their whiteness, large size, roundness, polish, and weight, qualities which are not easily to be found united in the same. Indeed, no two pearls are ever found perfectly alike, and it was from this circumstance, no doubt, that our Roman luxury first gave them the name of unio, or the unique gem, for a similar name is not given them by the Greeks nor among the barbarians by whom they are found are they called anything else but margarite even in the very whiteness of the pearl there is a great difference to be observed those are of a much clearer water that are found in the red sea while the indian pearl resembles in tint the scales of the mirror stone but exceeds all the others in size the colour that is most highly prized of all is that of the alum coloured pearls long pearls have their peculiar value especially those called elenchi which are of a long tapering shape resembling our alabaster boxes in form and ending in a full bulb footnote these alabaster boxes for unguents mentioned elsewhere by pliny were usually pear-shaped and as they were held with difficulty in the hand on account of their extreme smoothness they were called alabastra from a naught and labastre to be held such was the offer made to our saviour of an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard very precious seneca says that the roman matrons were not satisfied unless they had two or three patrimonies suspended from each ear and a footnote our ladies quite glory in having these suspended from their fingers or two or three of them dangling from their ears. For the purpose of ministering to these luxurious tastes, there are various names and wearisome refinements which have been devised by profuseness and prodigality. For after inventing these earrings, they have given them the name of Crotalia, or Castanet Pendants, as though quite delighted even with the rattling of the pearls as they knock against each other, and at the present day, the poorer classes are affecting them, as people are in the habit of saying, that a pearl worn by a woman in public 
is as good as a lictor walking before her footnote the pearls as fully bespoke the importance of the wearer as the lictor did of the magistrate whom he was preceding the honour of being escorted by one or two lictors was usually granted to the wives and other members of the imperial family End of footnote. nay even more than this they put them on their feet and that not only on the laces of their sandals but all over the shoes it is not enough to wear pearls but they must tread upon them and walk with them underfoot as well pearls used formerly to be found in our sea but more frequently about the thracian bosporus they were of a red colour and small and enclosed in a shellfish known by the name of mice in acarnania there is a shellfish called pina which produces pearls and juba states that on the shores of arabia a shellfish is found which resembles a notched comb covered all over with hair like a sea urchin and the pearl lies embedded in its flesh bearing a strong resemblance to a hailstone no such shellfish however as these are ever brought to rome the acarnanian pearl is shapeless rough and of a marble hue those are better which are found in the vicinity of actium it is quite clear that the interior of the pearl is solid as no foal is able to break it pearls are found in various places in the body of the animal indeed i have seen some which lay at the edge of the shell just as though in the very act of coming forth and in some fishes as many as four or five up to the present time very few have been found which exceeded half an ounce in weight by more than one scruple footnote tavernier speaks of a remarkable pearl that was found at katifa in arabia the fishery alluded to by pliny and which he bought for the sum of five hundred thousand dollars of our money it is pear-shaped the elenchus of the ancients regular and without blemish the diameter is point sixty three of an inch at the largest part and the length from two to three inches it is now in the possession of the shah of persia End of footnote. it is a well ascertained fact that in britannia pearls are found though small and of bad colour for the deified julius caesar wished it to be distinctly understood that the breastplate which he dedicated to venus genetrix in her temple was made of british pearls i once saw lolia paulina the wife of the emperor caligula it was not at any public festival or any solemn ceremonial but only an ordinary wedding entertainment covered with emeralds and pearls which shone in alternate layers upon her head in her hair in her wreaths in her ear upon her neck in her bracelets and on her fingers and the value of which amounted in all to forty millions of sesterces one million five hundred twenty five thousand dollars indeed she was prepared at once to prove the fact by showing the receipts and acquittances nor were these any presents made by a prodigal potentate but treasures which had descended to her from her grandfather and obtained by the spoliation of the provinces such are the fruits of plunder and extortion it was for this reason that marcus lollius was held so infamous all over the east for the presents which he extorted from the kings as a result of which he was finally denied the friendship of caius caesar and took poison and all this was done i say that his granddaughter might be seen by the glare of lamps covered all over with jewels to the amount of forty millions of sesterces now let a person only picture to himself on the one hand what was the value of the habits worn by curious or fabricious in their triumphs let him picture to himself the objects displayed to the public on their triumphal litters and then on the other hand let him think upon this lolia this one bit of a woman the head of an empire taking her place at table thus attired 
would he not much rather that the conquerors had been torn from their very chariots than that they had conquered for such a result as this yet even these are not the most supreme evidences of luxury there were formerly two pearls the largest that had been ever seen in the whole world cleopatra the last of the queens of egypt came into possession of them both by descent from the kings of the east when antony had been sated by her day after day with the most exquisite banquets this queenly woman inflated with vanity and disdainful arrogance affected to treat all this sumptuousness and all these vast preparations with the greatest contempt upon which antony inquired what there was that could possibly be added to such extraordinary magnificence to this she made answer that on a single entertainment she would expend ten millions of sesterces antony was extremely desirous to learn how that could be done but looked upon it as a thing quite impossible and a wager was the result on the following day upon which the matter was to be decided in order that she might not lose the wager she had an entertainment set before antony magnificent in every respect though no better than his usual repast upon this antony joked her and inquired what was the amount expended upon it to which she made answer that the banquet which he then beheld was only a trifling appendage to the real banquet and that she alone would consume at the meal to the ascertained value of that amount she herself would swallow the ten millions of sesterces and so ordered the second course to be served in obedience to her instructions the servants placed before her a single vessel which was filled with vinegar a liquid the sharpness and strength of which is able to dissolve pearls at this moment she was wearing in her ears those choicest and most unique productions of nature and while antony was waiting to see what she was going to do taking one of them from out of her ear she threw it into the vinegar and as soon as it was melted swallowed it lucius plancus who had been named umpire in the wager placed his hand upon the other at the very instant that she was making preparations to dissolve it in a similar manner and declared that antony had lost an omen which in the result was fully confirmed the fame of the second pearl is equal to that which attends its fellow after the queen who had thus come off victorious on so important a question had been seized it was cut asunder in order that this the other half of the entertainment might serve as pendants for the ears of venus in the pantheon at rome antony and cleopatra however will not bear away the palm of prodigality in this respect and will be stripped of even this boast in the annals of luxury for before their time clodius the son of the tragic actor Aesopus, had done the same at rome having been left by his father heir to his ample wealth and possessions let not antony then be too proud for all his triumvirate since he can hardly stand in comparison with an actor one too who had no wager to induce him a thing which adds to the regal munificence of the act but was merely desirous of trying by way of glorification to his palate what was the taste of pearls as he found it to be wonderfully pleasing that he might not be the only one to know it he had a pearl set before each of his guests for him to swallow after the surrender of alexandria pearls came into common and indeed universal use at rome but they first began to be used about the time of scylla though but of small size and of little value fenestella says in this however it is quite evident that he is mistaken for elias stylo tells us that it was in the time of the jugurthine war that the name of unio was first given to pearls of remarkable size End of book six chapter eleven book six chapter twelve of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The nature of the murex and the purple. And yet pearls may be looked upon as pretty nearly a possession of everlasting duration. They descend from a man to his heir, and they are alienated from one to another just like any landed estate but the colours that are extracted from the murex and the purple fade from hour to hour and yet luxury which has similarly acted as a mother to them has set upon them prices almost equal to those of pearls purples commonly live seven years like the murex they keep themselves in concealment for thirty days about the time of the rising of the dog star in the spring season they unite in large bodies and by rubbing against each other produce a viscous saliva from which a kind of wax is formed the murex does the same but the purple has that exquisite juice which is so greatly sought after for the purpose of dyeing cloth situated in the middle of the throat this secretion consists of a tiny drop contained in the white vein from which the precious liquid used for dyeing is distilled being of the tint of a rose somewhat inclining to black the rest of the body is entirely destitute of this juice it is a great point to take the fish alive for when it dies it ejects this juice from the larger ones it is extracted after taking off the shell but the small fish are crushed alive together with the shells upon which they eject this secretion in asia the best purple is that of tyre in africa that of meninx and the parts of gaetulia that border on the ocean and in europe that of laconia it is for this colour that the fasces and the axes of rome make way in the crowd it is this that asserts the majesty of childhood footnote the roman consuls were clothed with the toga praetexta the colour of which was syrian purple all children of free birth bore the praetexta edged with purple and the purple laticlave or broad hem of the senator's toga distinguished him from the equis who wore a toga with an angusticlave or narrow hem End of footnote it is this that distinguishes the senator from the man of equestrian rank by persons arrayed in this colour are prayers addressed to propitiate the gods on every garment it sheds a lustre and in the triumphal vestment it is to be seen mingled with gold let us be prepared then to excuse this frantic passion for purple even though at the same time we are compelled to inquire why it is that such a high value has been set upon the produce of this shellfish seeing that while in the dye the smell of it is offensive and the colour then is harsh of a greenish hue and strongly resembling that of the sea when in a tempestuous state the tongue of the purple is a finger in length and by means of this it finds subsistence by piercing other shellfish so hard is the point of it they die in fresh water and in places where rivers discharge themselves into the sea otherwise when taken they will live as long as fifty days on their saliva all shellfish grow very fast purples especially they come to their full size at the end of a year were i at this point to pass on to other subjects luxury no doubt would think itself defrauded of its due and so accuse me of negligence i must therefore make my way into the very workshops so that just as among articles of food the various kinds and qualities of corn are known all those who place the enjoyment of life in these luxuries may have a still better acquaintance with the objects for which they live there are two kinds of fish that produce the purple colour the elements in both are the same the combinations only are different the smaller fish is that which is called the buccinum from its resemblance to the conch by which the sound of the buccinus or trumpet is produced and to this circumstance it owes its name the opening in it is round with an incision in the margin 
the other fish is known as the purpura or purple and has a grooved and projecting muzzle which being tubulated on one side in the interior forms a passage for the tongue besides which the shell is studded with points up to the very apex which are ordinarily seven in number and disposed in a circle these are not found on the buccinum though both of them have as many spirals as they are years old the buccinum attaches itself only to crags and is gathered about rocky places purples are of numerous kinds differing only in their element and place of abode there is the mud purple the seaweed purple both of which are held in the very lowest esteem the reef purple which is collected on the reefs or out at sea the colour from which is still too light and thin then there is the variety known as the pebble purple wonderfully well adapted for dyeing and better than any of them that known by the name of dialutensis because of the various natures of the soil on which it feeds purples are taken with a kind of osier kype of small size and with large meshes these are cast into the sea baited with cockles which snap at an object just as we see mussels do and close the shells instantaneously though half dead when they are returned to the sea these animals come to life again and open their shells with avidity upon which the purples seek them and commence the attack by protruding their tongues the cockles on the other hand the moment they feel themselves pricked shut their shells and hold fast the object that has wounded them in this way victims to their greediness they are drawn up to the surface hanging by the tongue the most favourable season for taking these fish is after the rising of the dog star or else before spring for when they have once discharged their waxy secretion their juices have no consistency this however is a fact unknown in the dyer's workshop although it is a point of primary importance after it is taken the vein is extracted of which we have previously spoken to which it is requisite to add salt twenty ounces to every hundred pounds of juice they are then left to steep for a period not exceeding three days for the fresher they are the greater virtue there is in the liquor it is then set to boil in vessels of tin and every eight thousand pounds ought to be boiled down to five hundred pounds of dye by the application of a moderate heat for which purpose the vessel is placed at the end of a long funnel communicating with the furnace while thus boiling the liquor is skimmed from time to time and with it the flesh which necessarily adheres to the veins about the tenth day generally the whole contents of the cauldron are in a liquefied state upon which a fleece from which the grease has been cleansed is plunged into it by way of making trial but until such time as the colour is found to satisfy the wishes of those preparing it the liquor is still kept on the boil the tint that inclines to red is looked upon as inferior to that which is of a blackish hue the wool is left to lie in soak for five hours and then after carding it it is thrown in again until it has fully imbibed the colour of that bright lustre which approaches the shining crimson hue of the kermes berry a tint that is particularly valued end of book six chapter twelve book six chapter thirteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Bodies which have a third nature, that of the animal and vegetable combined. For my own part, I am strongly of opinion that there is sense existing in those bodies which have the nature of neither animals nor vegetables, but a third which partakes of them both. Sea nettles and sponges, I mean the sea-nettle wanders to and fro by night 
and at night changes its locality these creatures are by nature a sort of fleshy branch and are nurtured upon flesh they have the power of producing a smarting pain just like that caused by the nettle found on land for the purpose of seeking its prey it contracts and stiffens itself to the utmost possible extent and then as a small fish swims past it will suddenly spread out its branches and so seize and devour it at another time it will assume the appearance of being quite withered away and let itself be tossed to and fro by the waves like a piece of seaweed until it happens to touch a fish the moment it does so the fish goes to rub itself against the rock to get rid of the itching immediately upon which the nettle pounces upon it by night also it is on the lookout for scallops and sea urchins when it perceives a hand approaching it it instantly changes its colour and contracts itself when touched it produces a burning sensation and if ever so short a time is afforded makes its escape sponges grow on rocks and feed upon shell and other fish and slime it would appear that these creatures too have some intelligence for as soon as they feel the hand about to tear them off they contract themselves and are separated with much greater difficulty they do the same also when the waves buffet them to and fro about tyrone it is said that they will survive after they have been detached and that they grow again from the roots which have been left adhering to the rock they leave a colour like blood upon the rock from which they have been detached especially those which are produced in the certes of africa the manos is the one that grows to the largest size but the softest of all are those found in the vicinity of lycia where the sea is deep and calm they are more particularly soft while those which are found in the hellespont are rough and those in the vicinity of malia coarse when lying in places exposed to the sun they become putrid hence those which are found in deep water are the best while they are alive they are of the same blackish colour that they are when saturated with water they adhere to the rock not by one part only nor yet by the whole body and within them there are a number of empty tubes generally four or five in number by means of which it is thought they take their food there are other tubes also but these are closed at the upper extremity and a sort of membrane is supposed to be spread beneath the roots by which they adhere it is well known that sponges are very long lived end of book six chapter thirteen book six chapter fourteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone the shark vast numbers of sharks infest the seas in the vicinity of the sponges to the great peril of those who dive for them these persons say that a sort of dense cloud gradually thickens over their heads bearing a resemblance to some kind of animal like a flat fish and that pressing downward upon them it prevents them from returning to the surface it is for this reason that they carry stilettos with them very sharp at the point and attached to them by strings for if they did not pierce the object with the help of these it could not be got rid of this however is entirely the result in my opinion of the darkness and their own fears for no person has ever yet been able to find among living creatures the fish cloud or the fish fog the name which they give to this enemy of theirs the divers however have terrible combats with the sharks which attack with avidity the groin the heels and all the whiter parts of the body the only means of ensuring safety is to go boldly to meet them and so by taking the initiative strike them with alarm 
for in fact this animal is just as much frightened at man as man is at it and they are on quite an equal footing when beneath the water but the moment the diver has reached the surface the danger is much more imminent for he loses the power of boldly meeting his adversary while he is endeavouring to make his way out of the water and his only chance of safety is in his companions who draw him along by a cord that is fastened under his shoulders while he is engaging with the enemy he keeps pulling this cord with his left hand according as there may be any sign of immediate peril while with the right he wields the stiletto which he is using in his defence at first they draw him along at a moderate pace but as soon as they have got him close to the ship if they do not whip him out in an instant with the greatest possible celerity they see him snapped asunder and many a time too the diver even when already drawn out is dragged from their hands through neglecting to aid the efforts of those who are assisting him by rolling up his body in the shape of a bowl the others it is true are in the meantime brandishing their pronged fish spears but the monster has the craftiness to place himself beneath the ship and so wage the warfare in safety consequently every possible care is taken by the divers to look out for the approach of this enemy the surest sign of safety is to see flatfish which never frequent the spots where these noxious monsters are found and for this reason the divers call them sacred end of book six chapter fourteen book six chapter fifteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone oyster beds and fish preserves the first person who formed artificial oyster beds was sergius orata who established them at baie in the time of lucius crassus the orator just before the marsic war this was done by him not for the gratification of gluttony but as a commercial venture and he contrived to make a large income by this exercise of his ingenuity he was the first to invent hanging baths over heating furnaces and after buying villas and trimming them up he would every now and then sell them again he too was the first to adjudge the pre-eminence for delicacy of flavour to the oysters of lake lucranus for every kind of aquatic animal is superior in one place to what it is in another thus for instance the wolf-fish of the river tiber is the best that is caught between the two bridges and the turbot of ravenna is the most esteemed the murina of sicily the elops of rhodes the same too as the other kinds not to go through all the items of the culinary catalogue the british shores had not as yet sent their supplies at a time when orata thus ennobled the lucrine oysters at a later period however it was thought worth while to fetch oysters all the way from brundisium at the very extremity of italy and in order that there might exist no rivalry between the two flavours a plan has been more recently hit upon of feeding the oysters of brundisium in lake lucrinus famished as they must naturally be after so long a journey in the same age Lucinius Marina was the first to form preserves for other fish, and his example was soon followed by the noble families of the Philippi and the Hortensiae. Lucullus had a mountain pierced near Naples at a greater outlay even than that which had been expended on his villa, in order to admit the sea to his preserves. For this reason, Pompey gave him the name of Xerxes in a toga. Footnote xerxen togatum or the roman xerxes in allusion to xerxes cutting a canal through the isthmus which connected the peninsula of mount athos with chalcides End of footnote. after his death the fish in his preserves were sold for the sum of four million sesterces 
$150,000. C. Hirus was the first person who formed preserves for the Murina. He lent 6,000 of these fishes for the triumphal banquets of Caesar the dictator, on which occasion he had them duly weighed, as he declined to receive the value of them in money or any other commodity. His villa, which was of a very humble character in the interior, sold for four millions of sesterces, in consequence of the valuable nature of the stock-ponds there. Next, after this, there arose a passion for individual fish. At Bauli, in the territory of Baie, the orator Hortensius had some fish preserves, in which there was a murina to which he became so much attached as to be supposed to have wept on hearing of its death. It was at the same villa that Antonia, the wife of Drusus, placed earrings upon a murina which she had become fond of, the report of which singular circumstance attracted many visitors to the place. Fulvius Lupinus first formed preserves for sea snails in the territory of Tarquinii, shortly before the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. He also carefully distinguished them by their several species, separating them from one another. The white ones were those that are produced in the district of Reate. Those of Illyria were remarkable for the largeness of their size, while those from Africa were the most prolific. Those, however, from the promontory of the sun were the most esteemed of all. For the purpose of fattening them, he invented a mixture of boiled wine, spelt meal, and other substances, so that fattened periwinkles became quite an object of gastronomy, and the art of breeding them was brought to such a pitch of perfection that the shell of a single animal would hold as much as eighty quadrantes, fifteen quarts. This we learn from Marcus Varro. End of Book 6, Chapter 15book six chapter sixteen of the boys and girls pliny by pliny the elder this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone land fishes there are still some wonderful kinds of fishes which we find mentioned by theophrastus he says that when the waters subside which have been admitted for the purposes of irrigation in the vicinity of babylon there are certain fish which remain in such holes as may contain water. From these they come forth, for the purpose of feeding, moving along by their fins by the aid of a rapid movement of the tail. If pursued, he says, they retreat to their holes, and when they have reached them, will turn round and make a stand. The head is like that of the sea-frog, while the other parts are similar to those of the gobio, and they have gills like other fish. He says also that in the vicinity of Heraclea and Cromna, and about the river Lycus, as well as in many parts of the Black Sea, there is one kind of fish which frequents the waters near the banks of the rivers, and makes holes for itself, in which it lives, even when the water retires and the bed of the river is dry, for which reason these fishes have to be dug out of the ground, and only show by the movement of the body that they are still alive. He says also that in the vicinity of the same Heraclea, when the river Lycus ebbs, the eggs are left in the mud, and that the fish, on being produced from these, go forth to seek their food by means of a sort of fluttering motion, their gills being but very small, in consequence of which they are not in need of water. It is in this way that eels also can live so long out of water, and that their eggs come to maturity on dry land, like those of the sea tortoise. In the same regions of the Black Sea, he says, various kinds of fishes are overtaken by the ice, the gobio more particularly, and they only betray signs of life by moving when they have warmth applied by the saucepan. All these things, however, though very remarkable, still admit of some explanation. End of Book 6, Chapter 16 
Book Six, Chapter Seventeen of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. How the fish called the Antheas is taken. It would not be right to omit what is said about the fish called Antheas, and which I find is looked upon as true by most writers. I have already mentioned the Caledoniae, certain islands off the coast of Asia, in the midst of a sea full of crags and reefs. These parts are much frequented by this fish, which is very speedily taken by the employment of a single method of catching it. A fisherman pushes out in a little boat, dressed in a colour resembling that of his boat, and every day, for several days together, at the same hour, he sails over the same space, while doing which he throws a quantity of bait into the sea. Whatever is thrown from the boat is an object of suspicion to the fish, who keep at a distance from what causes them so much alarm. But after this has been repeated a considerable number of times, one of the fish, reassured by coming habituated to the scene, at last snaps at the bait. The movements of this one are watched with the greatest care and attention, for in it are centred all the hopes of the fishermen, as it is to be the means of securing them their prey. Nor is it difficult to recognise it, seeing that for some days it is the only one that ventures to come near the bait. At last, however, it finds some others to follow its example, and by degrees it is better and better attended, till at last it brings with it shoals innumerable. The older ones, at length becoming quite accustomed to the fishermen, easily recognize him, and will even take food from his hands. Upon this the man throws out, a little way beyond the tips of his fingers, a hook concealed in a bait, and smuggles them out one by one, standing in the shadow of the boat and whipping them out of the water with a slight jerk that the others may not perceive it meantime another fisherman is ready inside to receive them upon pieces of cloth in order that no floundering about or other noise may scare the others away it is of importance to know which has been the betrayer of the others and not to take it otherwise the shoal will take to flight and appear no more for the future. There is a story that a fisherman who quarrelled once with his mate threw out a hook to one of these leading fishes, which he easily recognised, and so captured it with a malicious intent. But the fish was recognised in the market by the other fisherman, against whom he had conceived this malice, who accordingly brought an action against him for damages and as musianus adds he was condemned to pay them on the hearing of the case these anthea it is said when they see one of their number taken with a hook cut the line with the serrated spines which they have on the back the one that is held fast stretching it out as much as it can to enable them to cut it End of book six chapter seventeen Book Six, Chapter Eighteen of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Echinaeus and the Torpedo. Following the proper order of things, we have now arrived at the culminating point of the wonders manifested to us by the operations of nature. For what is there more unruly than the sea? with its winds, its tornadoes, and its tempests. And yet, in what department of her works has nature been more seconded by the ingenuity of man than in this by his inventions of sails and of oars? In addition to this, we are struck with the ineffable might displayed by the ocean's tides as they constantly ebb and flow and so regulate the currents of the sea as though they were the waters of one vast river. And yet all these forces, though acting in unison, and impelling in the same direction a single fish, and that of a very diminutive size, the fish known as the echinaeus, possesses the power of counteracting. 
winds may blow and storms may rage and yet the echeneus controls their fury restrains their mighty force and bids ships stand still in their career a result which no cables no anchors from their ponderousness quite incapable of being weighed could ever have produced a fish bridles the impetuous violence of the deep and subdues the frantic rage of the universe and all this by no effort of its own no act of resistance on its part no act at all in fact but that of adhering to the bark trifling as this object would appear it suffices to counteract all these forces combined and to forbid the ship to pass onward in its way fleets armed for war pile up towers and bulwarks on their decks in order that upon the deep even men may fight from behind ramparts as it were but alas for human vanity when their prows beaked as they are with bronze and with iron and armed for the onset can thus be arrested and riveted to the spot by a little fish no more than half a foot in length at the battle of actium it is said a fish of this kind stopped the praetorian ship of antonius in its course at the moment that he was hastening from ship to ship to encourage and exhort his men and so compelled him to leave it and go on board another footnote an absurd tradition invented to palliate the disgrace of his defeat End of footnote. so that the fleet of caesar gained the advantage in the onset and charged with a redoubled impetuosity in our own time too one of these fish arrested the ship of the emperor caius caligula in its course when he was returning from astura to antium and thus as the result proved did an insignificant fish give presage of great events for no sooner had the emperor returned to rome than he was pierced by the weapons of his own soldiers nor did this sudden stoppage of the ship long remain a mystery the cause being perceived upon finding that out of the whole fleet the emperor's five-banked galley was the only one that was making no way the moment this was discovered some of the sailors plunged into the sea and on making search about the ship's sides they found an echeneus adhering to the rudder upon its being shown to the emperor he strongly expressed his indignation that such an obstacle as this should have impeded his progress and rendered powerless the hearty endeavours of four hundred men particularly as the fish had no such power when brought on board footnote if there was any foundation at all for the story there can be little doubt that the trick was played for the purpose of imposing upon caligula's superstitious credulity and that the rowers as well as the diving sailors were in the secret End of footnote according to the persons who examined it on that occasion and who have seen it since the echeneus bears a strong resemblance to a large slug some of our own authors have given this fish the latin name of mora footnote delay and a footnote if he had not this illustration by the agency of the echeneus would it not have been quite sufficient only to cite the instance of the torpedo another inhabitant also of the sea as a manifestation of the mighty powers of nature from a considerable distance even and if only touched with the end of a spear or a staff this fish has the property of benumbing even the most vigorous arm and of riveting the feet of the runner however swift he may be in the race end of book six chapter eighteen Book Six, Chapter Nineteen of *The Boys and Girls Pliny* by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The instincts and peculiarities of fishes. The statements which Ovid has made as to the instincts of fish, in the work of his known as the Treatise on Fishes, appears to me truly marvellous. Footnote of this work begun by ovid during his banishment in pontus 
and probably never completed, only a fragment of one hundred and thirty-two lines has come down to us. End of footnote. The scarus, for instance, when enclosed in the wicker kipe, makes no effort to escape with its hand, nor does it attempt to thrust its muzzle between the osiers, but turning its tail towards them, it enlarges the orifices with repeated blows therefrom, and so makes its escape backwards. Should, too, another scarus, from without, chance to see it thus struggling within the kipe, it will take the tail of the other in its mouth, and so aid it in its efforts to escape. The lupus, again, when surrounded with the net, furrows the sand with its tail, and so conceals itself, until the net has passed over it. The murena, trusting in the slippery smoothness of its rounded back, boldly faces the meshes of the net, and by repeatedly wriggling its body, makes its escape. The polyp makes for the hooks, and without swallowing the bait, clasps it with its feelers nor does it quit its hold until it has eaten off the bait, or perceives itself being drawn out of the water by the rod. The mullet, too, is aware that within the bait there is a hook concealed, and is on its guard against the ambush. Still, however, so great is its ferocity, that it beats the hook with its tail, and strikes away from it the bait. The lupus, again, shows less foresight and address, but repentance at its imprudence arms it with mighty strength, for when caught by the hook it flounders from side to side, and so widens the wound, till at last the insidious hook falls from its mouth. The murena not only swallows the hook, but catches at the line with its teeth, and so gnaws it asunder. The antheus, Ovid says, the moment it finds itself caught by the hook, turns its body with its back downwards, upon which there is a sharp knife-like fin, and so cuts the line asunder. Trebius Niger informs us that whenever the loligo is seen darting above the surface of the water, it portends a change of weather, that the Cypheus, or in other words the swordfish, has a sharp pointed muzzle, with which it is able to pierce the sides of a ship and send it to the bottom instances of which have been known near Cot, a place in Mauritania, not far from the river Lixus. He says, too, that the loligo sometimes darts above the surface, in such vast numbers, as to sink the ships upon which they fall. At many of the country seats belonging to the emperor, the fish eat from the hand. Footnote Martial, Book Four, Epistle Thirty, speaks of this being the case at the fish ponds of Baye, where the emperor's fish were in the habit of making their appearance when called by name. End of footnote. In the fountain of Jupiter at Labranda, there are eels which eat from the hand and wear earrings. Footnote. In oars, he probably means ornaments suspended from the gills a thing which, in the case of eels, might be done. End of footnote. At Myra, too, in Lycia, the fish in the fountain of Apollo, known as Surium, appear and give oracular presages, when thrice summoned by the sound of a flute. If they seize the flesh thrown to them with avidity, it is a good omen for the person who consults them but if, on the other hand, they flap at it with their tails, it is considered an evil presage. At Hierapolis, in Syria, footnote, the seat of the worship of the half-fish goddess Adirga, Atergatis, Astarte, or Dercito, and the footnote. The fish in the lake of Venus obey the voice of the officers of the temple. Bedecked with ornaments of gold, they come at their call, fawn upon them while they are scratched, and open their mouths so wide as to admit of the insertion of the hand. End of Book 6, Chapter 19
Recording by phone. Coral. In the same degree that people in our part of the world set a value upon the pearls of India, do the people of India prize coral, it being the prevailing taste in each nation respectively that constitutes the value of things. Coral is produced in the Red Sea also, but of a more swarthy hue than ours. It is to be found also in the Persian Gulf, where it is known by the name of Iache. But the most highly esteemed of all is that produced in the vicinity of the islands called Stokades, in the Gallic Gulf, and near the Aeolian Islands and the town of Drapana in the Sea of Sicily. Coral is to be found growing, too, at Erythrae, where it is intensely red, but soft, and consequently little valued. Its form is that of a shrub, and its color green. Footnote. Theophrastus reckons coral among the precious stones, and Pliny would seem to be at a loss whether to consider it as an animal or a vegetable. End of footnote. Its berries are white and soft while under water, but the moment they are removed from it, they become hard and red, resembling the berries of cultivated coronel in size and appearance. They say that, while alive, if it is only touched by a person, it will immediately become as hard as stone, and hence it is that the greatest pains are taken to prevent this, by tearing it up from the bottom with nets, or else cutting it short with a sharp-edged instrument of iron, from which last circumstance it is generally supposed to have received its name of curalium. Footnote. From the Greek curatai, cut short. End of footnote. The reddest coral and the most branchy is held in the highest esteem, but at the same time it must not be rough or hard like stone, nor yet, on the other hand, should it be full of holes or hollow. The berries of coral are no less esteemed by the men in India than are the pearls of that country by the ladies among us. Their soothsayers, too, and diviners, look upon coral as an amulet endowed with sacred properties, and a sure preservative against all dangers. Hence it is that they equally value it as an ornament and as an object of devotion. Before it was known in what estimation coral was held by the people of India, the Gauls were in the habit of adorning their swords, shields, and helmets with it. But at the present day, owing to the value set upon it as an article of exportation, it has become so extremely rare that it is seldom to be seen even in the regions that produce it. Branches of coral, hung at the neck of infants, are thought to act as a preservative against danger. Calcined, pulverized, and taken in wine, or, if there are symptoms of fever, in water, it acts as a soporific. It resists the action of fire a considerable time before it is calcined. End of Book 6, Chapter 20Book Six, Chapter Twenty One of the Boys and Girls Pliny by Pliny the Elder. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. The Various Kinds of Oysters. The palm has been awarded to oysters at our tables as a most exquisite dish. Oysters love fresh water and spots where numerous rivers discharge themselves into the sea. Generally speaking, they increase in size with the increase of the moon, but it is at the beginning of summer more particularly, and when the rays of the sun penetrate the shallow waters, that they are swollen with an abundance of milk. Footnote. It is at the spawning season that this milky liquid is found in the oyster, a period at which the meat of the fish is considered unwholesome as food. We have a saying that the oyster should never be eaten in the months without an R. That the same too was the opinion in the Middle Ages is proved by the Leonine line Mensibus eratus vos ostrea manducatis. In the Ard months you may your oysters eat. End of footnote. 
oysters are of various colors in spain they are red in illyricum of a tawny hue and at circe black both in meat and shell but in every country those oysters are the most highly esteemed that are compact without being slimy from their secretions and are remarkable more for their thickness than their breadth they should never be taken in either muddy or sandy spots but from a firm hard bottom the meat should be compressed and not of a fleshy consistence and the oyster should be free from fringed edges and lying wholly in the cavity of the shell persons of experience in these matters add another characteristic a fine purple thread they say should run round the margins of the beard this being looked upon as a sign of superior quality and obtaining for them their name of calibre fara footnote literally having beautiful eyebrows End of footnote. oysters are all the better for travelling and being removed to new waters thus for example the oysters of brundisium it is thought when fed in the waters of avernus both retain their own native juices and acquire the flavour of those of lake lucrinus mucianus who is really a connoisseur says the oysters of Sisychus are larger than those of lake lucrinus fresher than those of the british coast footnote those of rutupe the present richbury in kent were highly esteemed by the romans see juvenal sat for one one forty one End of footnote. Sweeter than those of Medulae, more tasty than those of Ephesus, more plump than those of Lucas, less slimy than those of Corophas, more delicate than those of Istria, and whiter than those of Circe. For all this, however, it is a fact well ascertained that there are no oysters fresher or more delicate than those of Circe, last mentioned according to the historians of the expedition of alexander there were oysters found in the indian sea a foot in diameter footnote they probably gave the name of oyster to some other shellfish of large size in cook's voyages we read of cockles in the pacific which two men were unable to carry End of footnote among ourselves too the nomenclature of some spendthrift and gourmand has found for certain oysters the name of tridacna footnote from tris thrice and sukeo to bite End of footnote. wishing it to be understood thereby that they are so large as to require three bites in eating them we will take the present opportunity of stating all the medicinal properties that are attributed to oysters they are singularly refreshing to the stomach and tend to restore the appetite footnote adjasson however remarks that many persons are unable to digest oysters in an uncooked state End of footnote. Luxury, too, has imparted to them an additional coolness by burying them in snow, thus making a medley of the produce of the tops of mountains and the bottom of the sea. Calcined oyster shells, mixed with honey, are good sprinkled upon burns, and are highly esteemed as a dentifrice. End of Book 6, Chapter 21 Recording by phone End of The Boys and Girls Pliny, Volume 3, by Pliny the Elder.